Welcome back to the conversation, friends. I'm Jan Michelson. What we're going to do here is we're going to talk presidential politics again. We've been talking about uh, national politics all morning, uh, Governor Rick Perry, because we were just talking about the Occupy Des Moines uh, movement, which is just sort of a little mini wrinkle of what uh, some of the other, quote, uh, protest movements have been uh, doing around the country. Uh, do they, is there a wrinkle like that in, uh, in anywhere in Texas? Uh, there is. Um, I don't know how many cities, but Austin, which is generally a pretty good magnet for uh, those types of uh, protests or demonstrations, whatever you want to call them. So they've had one down at uh, City Hall in uh, Austin for some time. And best I can tell, other than last weekend, they had a little bit of scuffle and kerfluffle. But um, uh, it's mostly been peaceful and just people protesting. Uh, but you know, government cities and um, – in particular, university cities, they are generally uh, pretty good magnets for folks who have something to say and take a <laughs> take advantage of the First Amendment of the Constitution. Do you think they uh, any of the so-called protest movements? Do you think they have uh, any case to make? I mean, it, it, there's there yeah, I think they got a case to make. I just think they're making it at the wrong place. They ought to be at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the United States Capitol. I mean, if the issue is uh, we have allowed for uh, people who, to take advantage of the rules and the laws of this country and enrich themselves, uh, and, and Wall Street was obviously the target of this. Um, that's not where, from my perspective, the uh, the culprits are. The culprits were in Washington D.C. to let the uh, the Wall Streeters take advantage of of the rules and regulations. It was Washington D.C. that uh, passed the TARP. It was Washington D.C. that. Uh, poured out this stimulus money all across the country. It's Washington, D.C. that can't have the uh, uh, discipline to stop the spending. That's the issue, and that's the reason that our 20% flat tax, I think, catches a lot of people's attention and goes, hey, you know what? Now, that's something uh, simple, flat, uh, 20% deduct for our mortgage, deduct for charitable giving, deduct for the local taxes, and take 20% of it and put a uh, post his stamp on it and be done. It will substantially, if not forever, change IRS, which is one of my goals. The, um, some of the people who have evaluated the concept of flat tax have said, well, yeah, but that's not revenue neutral. You give a rip if it's revenue neutral? I care about spending, and I care about – look, we don't have a revenue problem in America. We have a spending problem. And I'd like to simplify the – um, the, the entire tax code, which is what we do with the plan that we laid out. But the real issue is spending uh, and having a president who is courageous enough to stand up and say, listen, earmarks are no more. It doesn't make any difference if you're a Democrat or Republican. If you send me a spending bill that's got earmarks on it, it will be vetoed. And then we can have this great discussion about whether you want to override my veto. Mm -hmm. uh, but, th I mean, that's just one example. Uh, we have to deal with the entitlement uh, issues that face this country. If you're on Social Security, if you have Social Security that you planned your future on, you're approaching that age, it's going to be there for you. And don't buy into anybody's scare tactic otherwise. But if you're a young person of 25, 26 years old just going into the workforce, why in the world would you believe for a moment that you're paying into a Social Security system that's going to be there? Uh, we know it's not. It's it's approaching uh, that period of time, and there's no money uh, uh, going to be available. And and I think 20, uh, 30 something, it it, it it's going to be a, a bankrupt. Well, we're already into the general fund by the tune of sixty billion dollars right now. Well, and and listen, the highway trust fund, you can't go take money out of it. So why wouldn't you do the same thing with the Social Security trust fund? Because we have to. No, you don't have to. That's just – that's the problem is people said, oh, we have to. You have to because you're not courageous enough to say no to spending. I mean, this, these guys are addicted. Washington, D.C. And, and some of these plans, you know, 59-point plan or the 999, they – I'll be real honest with you. Both of those, and particularly the 59-point plan that Mitt Romney lays out, it just kind of nibbles around the edges of the tax code. It leads – it leaves the same – uh, uh, structure in place. I mean, the, the brackets are still in place. That's a, that's going after our tax code with a tweezer. I think you need to go after Washington, D.C. and the tax code with a sledgehammer. Okay. <laughs> uh, some people have uh, suggested we grab a pitchfork. Uh, <laughs> a sledgehammer works for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Uh, the, we had a, They're both <laughs> useful tools if used in, in the proper way. <laughs> it's an attention-getting device, eh? Um, one of my listeners already emailed in a, a question. He's a, he's, I said, I'm busy on the tractor. I hope you can ask Mr. Perry. Mm. What agencies would you eliminate? Well, you would substantially reduce the size of a lot of them, but I'll give you an example of one. Why do we need a Department of Education? I mean, that that is a state issue. I'm a big as I hope you've talked about my book, Fed Up, Getting to uh, that. and uh, the the issue. I am a very very strong proponent of the Tenth Amendment. Uh, our founding fathers, uh, as they were developing our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, as they went through and formulated over those many years how America should function, one of the things that they put in place was a, a an amendment. Uh, and our Bill of Rights uh, that said that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution are prohibited to it by the states are reserved for the states or to the people respectively. And basically what that said was that the federal government was created to be an agent for the states, not the other way around. And so education uh, is not one of the issues that the federal government should be involved with at all. I mean, the idea that we need a federal government that is telling Iowans how to educate their children is foreign to me. All right. So it's um, it's an interesting irony that you as a current governor of Texas would say that. Previous governor of Texas, I had a chance to interview several years ago, uh, running for the same office to which you aspire. I asked him his first question was... Um, what will be your philosophy of judges? And he said, oh, yeah, original intent, strict constructionist. Mm -hmm. And what do you want to be the mark of your president? <laughs> no child left behind. Yeah. Well, I didn't vote for that guy because that's incoherent. Would you agree? Uh, I agree that when no child left behind came along, we did not support it in Texas, and we pushed back awfully hard. Uh, and race to the top was even worse. And not only that, he handed the car keys to Ted Kennedy to uh, to assemble the No Child Left Behind. Yeah, so a few, wasn't a, a wise things, choice, was it? I don't think that the federal government should be involved with issues dealing that that aren't very clearly laid out in the Constitution. Well, Ronald Reagan said, "We vote for me, and I'll get rid of the Department of Education." We voted for him, and he gave us uh, Mr. Bennett. Yeah. So if we vote for you, what happens to the Department of Education? It will go away. Uh, how? In what fashion? Um, I think you sit down and, and basically use the veto pen. Okay. Uh, that is a powerful tool that has not been used often enough. Matter of fact, I'm trying to think when it's been used hardly at all by any president. But as the governor of Texas, my first session, I vetoed 82 bills. There were some folks that just wanted to test me, I suppose. Do, 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 will, this, will this fella bend? Will he blink? And no, I don't. I will use the veto pen to do away with those agencies of government and, and put people into place to destruct them, if you will. And, and I use that word in a, in a, in a thoughtful way. Uh, when it comes to uh, if, if Congress won't work with you, if the, uh, the, 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 the length of time to put a constitutional amendment in to do the things that you're talking about, you can substantially impact those agencies. For instance, uh, you could um, cut those programs in half to, to begin with. Uh, send back uh, half of the money to the states and save $25 billion in the first year uh, alone. So um, if, if, if the point is in, in the first 100 days are you going to do away with an, an agency of government, I think that may be a I'm, – I'm not going to sit here and look you in the eye and say, yeah, that's possible. But I'll promise you one thing. Uh, we'll put men and women in place that will start destructing those uh, agencies of government that we should not have had in in place to begin with. The EPA is another great example of it. I talk about rebuilding the EPA, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily doing away with it, but let it become uh, a repository of best practices, uh, pull back every regulation that has been put in place since uh, 2008, test them, audit them for their beneficial impact versus their cost. My instinct is probably 99% of those wouldn't pass that test 
Get rid of them. Throw them away. A president can do that with executive order and executive actions. My in-studio guest is Governor Rick Perry. is visiting us here in Iowa, running for president. Um, how are you going to get your mojo back, sir? Oh, Mojo's back. It's uh, <laughs> Mojo didn't go anywhere. It's, it's still well. You started um, at thirty, and, uh, and you yeah. really hit a peak there for a while. And you just were you were it was almost like a shoe in, and then and things kind of got soft for a yeah, while. Yeah, there is no such thing as a shoe in in this business. Anybody that says, "Hey, man, you're at the top of the polls. You're going to stay at the top of the polls. You need to shuffle them off to the side real quick." <laughs> you know, in my third term, or running for my third term, I was down twenty five points in Texas, running against a very uh, well-known, very popular United States senator, and everybody had written my epitaph that, at that particular point in time. And, uh, you know, I just stay focused. I stay disciplined. I, I'm going to stay out here on the road and go to the places and talk about uh, uh, what Americans want to hear. And what Americans want to hear is who in the heck is it that's on that stage who has the uh, not just the rhetoric, but it's got the record of getting people back to work. And that's the biggest issue facing America, because we can't have a foreign policy that's impactful. We can't have a military that's as strong as it needs to be until we first have an economy that has got uh, Americans back working. And the way you do that is by freeing them up from overtaxation and overregulation in particular. Uh, and that's what my two-phase plan did. First one on energy, where I talked about without going to Congress, without asking Mother May I from Congress, you open up those federal lands, uh, particularly in the western part of the country, in those federal waters for the exploration of the energy that we have. I'm an all-of-the-above energy Well, guy. is that because right now they are blocked by executive order and they can be released by executive order? Absolutely. The, that, the Department of Interior could open up those lands for, for exploration, for instance. We're sitting on 300 years' worth of energy in this country. When you talk about the wind and the solar and the, uh, the alternative energy um, sources that we have, along with the natural gas and the crude and the coal, well, 300 years' worth, but we have yeah. a, an administration that basically said, we're going to put the coal industry out of place. We're going to drive up the cost of gasoline to where it appropriates um, what we see in Europe. And the president himself said electricity prices are going to necessarily skyrocket. I consider that to be nonsense because pushing Americans to green energy uh, without an alternative and taking our traditional sources and putting them off limits is nuts. Uh, Let's uh, talk to somebody who has questions about that particular subject. And this is Forrest. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Hi. Um, well, I was wondering, Governor, if um, – well, I've heard a lot about your energy plan, but uh, I wanted to know some more specifics, I guess. Um, where is it different than uh, your rivals for the nomination, and why uh, Why are those differences – What are those, how do they make your energy plan better? Well, we actually lay out a, a clear um, uh, plan from the standpoint of – opening up those federal lands i'm not sure anybody on the on the stage has has clearly said listen we're going to open up our our federal lands and and we're smart enough to know you're not going to go into the everglades you're not going to go into some of the pristine areas of, of but in the western states there is enough provable reserves well as a matter of fact more than what russia saudi arabia uh i think yemen uh iraq and venezuela combined bring into the United States. So why in the world would we not open up and drill safely, thoughtfully, uh, in an environmentally friendly way? We know we can do that in a safe way. Instead of sending billions, hundreds of billions of dollars to company, uh, countries that are hostile, in many cases, to America. Well, why? I always answer rhetorical questions. <laughs> well, the, way, the reason why we don't is because the last couple of administrations have said that use of fossil fuel is a risk to the health of uh, the planet Earth. They buy into climate change theory and want to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. But it's not. I mean, and that's basically the position that I've taken. And, and, and What's not? Uh, that man-made global warming is a fact. It's not. There's skeptics that come out every day, myself being one of them. I'm not a scientist, but when you have Nobel laureates who come out and say, you know what, I'm going to drop out of the American Physical Society uh, because uh, they have a statement that says man-made global warming is incontrovertible. Uh, It's not proven. And for us to put cap-and-trade legislation into place, which this administration wants to do, which Mitt Romney uh, said that he wanted to do when he was the governor of, of Massachusetts, and put our economy in that type of a uh, a pickle, if you will. I mean, that, that is, I, that 
is irresponsible. To put America's economy in jeopardy on science that's not proven. Uh, and you got India and China over there that are building plants, coal plants, uh, probably uh, still building one or two a, a, a month. Uh, and certainly not using the technology that we know how to use here in America. So the idea that uh, we're going to put America's economy in jeopardy on science that's not proven, and particularly that will make absolutely no difference in the, in the, in the world's economy, is, in my opinion, irresponsible. We're building uh, all kinds of alternatives, as you well know, up here in Iowa. You, ha- you are, too, in, in Texas. We build these big windmill turbines uh, and, and the, the, the big wings. Many of them are headed in your direction. You guys uh, consume a lot of the product, uh, the wind uh, mills uh, down there. You have one of the biggest commitments to wind energy in the in the country at the moment. How's, the, it, how's it working? The biggest, and it's working well. When you um, we we decided in 2007 that we were going to be um, very involved in the uh, uh, wind side of things. Well, let's and, con- let's and continue this right after the news. Great, if that's okay. Plus, we'll- right back to the conversation. I'm Jan Michelson. This is our Friday edition. We're talking here in the studio with Governor Rick Perry. He is here running for president, and he wants uh, to talk about issues, and you've been very patient. And uh, thank you so much for hopping on board. Uh, Let's begin with Jeff. Good morning, Jeff. Morning. Hi. Um, I'd first like to say that I I was a supporter of of, uh, Governor Perry, um, Body's book on the Boy Scouts, and uh, I commend him on his uh, uh, support of the Boy Scouts. But he completely lost me with the heartless statement. I've got a daughter I'm putting through college. I was responsible enough to uh, save up over my life to put her through college. And uh, she's going in state here. But the mere fact that my federal tax dollars go to help support some of the colleges in Texas, I'm sure, and that my daughter would be paying more than an illegal alien's child, gripes me to no end. And for him to call people heartless that don't agree with that is beyond all rationality. Uh, Governor Perry, that that, that uh, debate point you made yeah. resonated hugely it here did. in Iowa. I and, got a lot of feedback on and that. And I, I, I made a huge error by using that word, uh, and I apologize a number of times, but the, here, here's the facts. This, this wasn't an issue of heart. This was an issue of economics. And um, as a governor uh, and a governor of a state that has to deal with the repercussions of a federal government that has failed miserably to defend and secure our border uh, i don't get to sit on the sidelines and say okay let's just build a wall or let's load everybody up and ship them back to the country they're from Uh, all of those are very hard from a realistic standpoint so the state of Texas had to make a, a, a decision about how we're going to deal with these individuals who are here because the federal government demands that we educate them and demands that we give health care. Doesn't uh, demand that you give them a discount. For, no, but uh, we don't We don't give them correct? a discount. No, but we don't give them a discount. Oh, I, I, I've heard that it's right. as, as much yes, as a $100,000 right. discount. That, that is So that's incorrect. mistaken? A, well, it's a discount. It, why, should my, why should my daughter, a U.S. citizen, pay more than an illegal aliens that's what it boils Any, down to. anyone that's who, what it boils down to anyone who lives in texas for three years uh and as in the case of these young people who were brought there by no fault of their own uh are working towards getting their american citizenship play pay full in-state tuition that's the fact uh and the people of the state of texas made this choice are we going to have tax wasters are we going to have taxpayers? And, and, and that was the economic issue that the people of the state of Texas made. And this is a state-by-state state issue, and I, I totally respect if, if Iowa or any other state says, you know what, we're not interested in that, uh, th- then I, I would never, mm-hmm. ever, because of my strong support right. of the Tenth Amendment. But the people of the state of Texas, and I might add, by, out of 181 members of our legislature, there were only four dissenting votes. But we got to go back to why are states having to deal with this issue? Why is Arizona having to pass the laws on immigration? Why is Alabama having to do that? It's because we have a federal government that's failed in their responsibility of securing that border. I've had to deal with this for 10 years, Jan. Well, let, let so, me, can, I, can I harass you just a sure. little bit on this? Because uh, I've been following this here. We're, we're experiencing some of the same issues. This is from the uh, Department of Education's uh, website here in Iowa. 
uh, you'll be you'll, I, and I know you're up to speed on this because I've read your book and your book uh, it's called Fed Up. It's excellent, and you have an, an excellent chapter on the judiciary and judicial supremacy mm-hmm. and in the high cost uh, and social costs and literal costs that um, uh, we are paying because of uh, the court's intervention here. But from the website, uh, right here in uh, Des Moines, it says, In 1982, the U.S. Supreme Court held that equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment was violated by a Texas law that authorized public school districts to deny enrollment to children who are not legally admitted to the United States. That holding in Plyler v. Doe in 82 was dependent on the court's conclusions that illegal aliens are persons who maybe claim a benefit of the equal protection clause. But anyway, the, the point here, it was a 7-3 to three vote. The Plyler case mm-hmm. told your legislature they couldn't block admission to the schools K-12 for, for the children of illegals. It was a split decision, five to four. And all of those uh, generations uh, since the set was 82, I think it was 73. 82, 83. Uh, and and uh, through uh, the Bush administration, the Ann Richards administration, and through yours, the Texas taxpayers, because of that law, uh, I'm sorry, because of that court opinion, have been poning up hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to fund the the education of uh, the children of illegals. They are, in the Iowa, uh, they are using that same opinion, and they say Plyler is the controlling law today for states. They're doing exactly the same thing to Iowa taxpayers is what uh, that court case did to Texas taxpayers. Well, we've talked about this endlessly with my listeners. Court opinions aren't law. Uh, and, and it was a five to four, pretty, pretty stupid decision. The reason why you inherited this is because that stupid court case required taxpayers from your state to fund their education K-12, and now how do you tell the kids who have been, you've already invested hundreds of millions of dollars in, by the time they get to college, hey, we're not going to fund any more of this. That's a ridiculous proposition, too. Uh, Bring all this up to say this. Is Plyler law? Does a Supreme Court opinion constitute law? And shouldn't governors, including our own here in Iowa, including you in Texas, resist a ridiculous opinion like that? I certainly think that you can, uh, because we push back uh, on um, agencies' efforts to try to make Texas do a substantial number of things, whether it's the EPA or whether it's the Department of of Education, what have you. But here's the point that, that, that we're missing, I think. Two things. Number one, is the reason we're having this discussion is because of the federal government's complete and abject failure to secure the border. Agreed. I know how to secure the border. You put the the, uh, strategic fencing into place. You put the boots on the ground. You use the predator drones and the other aviation assets so that you can move almost instantaneously where there is activity that, that you have suspect that may be illegal in some form or fashion, but, and you can secure yeah. that border. I will suggest to I, you— I agree with it, that, sir. And, and I know but, our listeners will, too, but the, 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 this is in the context of judicial supremacy. Right. But, and, but, and you list a bunch of cases in, in your book how court cases have distorted public policy over and over— and uh, you're, you're running for the office of president. If the Supreme Court serves up nonsense, to what degree, what tools do you have at your disposal as a governor and as the future president to, to deal with aberrant uh, court decisions? Well, you obviously including can, Roe versus Wade and, was and, another one of those. And you obviously can go back and, and uh, work with your attorney general, as we've done on the Ten Commandments. Uh, where they said that we couldn't put the Ten Commandments on the Capitol grounds. We took that, we fought, we won. Uh, the Ten Commandments are still on the Texas uh, Capitol grounds. Here's w- w- what's important for the listeners out there. What kind of people am I going to put on the Supreme Court? And I'm going to put strict constructionists, real strict constructionists, that look at, like I've done, six of the nine Supreme Court justices on the Texas Supreme Court I appointed. These are strict constructionists. They're not legislators yeah, right. with robes. Right. I have to deal with two things here. I have to deal with reality, and the reality is the Texas legislature said, here is how we are going to, to uh, deal with these individuals that are here in this state, and we are forced to deal with them by federal court opinion. And the legislature said, here is how we're going to deal with it. If folks don't 
like that a, a decision that's made by Texas, then there are decisions that are made by other states that I don't agree with. No, we fully don't understand. move to those yeah. states. Well, but, we fully understand your decision because uh, because you, you, for the last uh, generation that was thrust upon you by a, a, a court yeah. ruling. But uh, but here, here's we're in the middle of a, a culture war, and uh, here in the state of Iowa, how to define marriage? Do judges decide that, or do the people decide that through DOMA? And if a judge decides to usurp those authorities, what tools do you have at your disposal as a governor or as a as a president to deal with judicial yeah. the philosophy of judicial supremacy? Well, two things. Number one, you can go back and and let allow the states to protect themselves. Uh, f- for instance, on the issue of traditional marriage, we passed a constitutional amendment in Texas. That it's one man, it's one woman. It passed by seventy five percent. Uh, I happen to think the same thing uh, will occur with Roe v. Wade when you put. Um, strict constructionist on to the Supreme Court and Roe v. Wade will be pushed back to the states. And at that particular point in time, the states will have uh, the decision to make whether or not we want to pass a constitutional amendment to the United States that protects life, that protects traditional marriage. Mm -hmm. And I would add one more that passes a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. It's interesting that all three of those need to pass so that America can get back to being the moral country that it was based upon. It's interesting when you were resisting Obamacare, you invoked the Tenth Amendment, and I think properly so. Uh, even even issuing words like uh, some some people in the political class in Texas even thought about secession. I mean, I mean, I know that those it, 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 it's being so aggravated at federal intrusion into. Uh, areas that are not constitutional that you'd invoke Tenth Amendment, tell these guys to go play in the highway, and I think that is a, that's the appropriate response. Yeah, you're the not telling the judiciary to do the, exactly the same thing when they get out of uh, their constitutional uh, uh, borders is, is I know that Iowans want a, a presidential candidate that is willing to take on the judiciary. Not just to replace members of the of the existing court, but to challenge their illegal jurisdiction by t- by saying, "Hey, you're not going to do this. You're not going to mess with Texas like this." And, and we have on a number of cases, and and you know, I, if if the point is uh, we have missed on on some that people and I would don't agree with, right. I, I I respect that. But again, I respect right. the Tenth Got Amendment it. more than I do the opinion of someone from another state as they look over our borders and say, what you've done there, we don't agree with. Absolutely. And I will stand forever with Iowans or with, as a matter of fact, I didn't agree with everything in the Arizona law. Right. Uh, but I sure joined with Governor Brewer and Arizona in an amicus brief to support their right to pass the law that they think is the best for their state. So, um, you know, I'm I'm not confused that uh, the people of the state of Texas made a decision that some other folks don't agree with, but that's Texans' rights as a Tenth Amendment, and I will stand up and support that. And I also will support another state. But they made that choice because they thought they had to. They were being required to by a split decision, court decision. They thought they didn't have another choice. And I'm not, I'm I'm not sure that's the case. I, 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 you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and try to split hairs. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not sure that uh, out of 181 members of the Texas legislature that there were only four members of the legislature uh, that said, you know what, uh, we're going to do this because we disagree with, oh, with I'm, the court I'm, I'm, I'm on this. I'm talking about the chronology. Now, after a yeah. generation of being doing this, they should have been resisted immediately in 82. That's right. what I was suggesting. They, they thought they had to do that. They didn't. They shouldn't have done it. They should have told the, the, the court to go play in the highway back in 82. So you're stuck with the legacy of the g- generations of neglect. Well, this country stuck with the, uh, a legacy of a lot of things that were bad going back to uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, the passage of the, right. of, of the 16th Amendment <laughs> moving forward from there, in my opinion. Right, and the I, book fed up, and I, I kind of go through that. Excellent. A brief timeout, last one, our in-studio guest, 1040 WHO Radio. We have just a few moments remaining with our guest, Governor Rick Perry, and you have a chance to chat with him right now. 284-1040 or 800-469-4295. This is Chuck. Morning, Chuck. Hi, Jan. Hi. Uh, Governor, I have one quick comment and then one question. Uh, My comment is on the Roe versus Wade, there's a little paragraph in there that if any governor would just pass a bill saying that life begins at conception, under Roe versus Wade, all abortions would become illegal. 
We've actually um, uh, passed that in Texas. That, uh, um, matter of fact, we, I, I think Senator Steve Ogden uh, passed that legislation back uh, uh, a couple of years back. And there's not, best I can tell, no more pro-life uh, work that's been done than uh, during the decade that I've been the governor of Texas. Parental notification, parental consent, uh, protecting uh, the life of a uh, uh, of a fetus. Um, and uh, also this last session that abortion cannot be given without a sonogram first um, so being showed to the to the individual so from from a a pro-life standpoint um, Texas has been very much on the the leading edge of, of protecting life and and uh, you know when, when we talk about life liberty and the pursuit of happiness uh, we mean it we mean it in Texas and I think a president of the United States needs to bring that same um, position to the presidency and to Washington, D.C. Uh, Jan, you know, we talked about, excuse me, we're going to let him ask his question. Saying, we were talking okay. uh, off the air about uh, one of the ways to deal with these uh, activist judges. And right. One of the things that I've uh, offered up is uh, that you actually have a term limit uh, for federal judges instead of this concept, and, and you're absolutely correct in that, you know, they're – as long as they perform appropriately and adequately, then they are on the bench for life. Mm-hmm. Um, my point is, why would you want to put somebody on the court for life? Um, a, a lot of reasons to, I think, have a, a reasonable term limit on federal judges. Is the um, is that something that can be done th- through statute, or can that be done through – does that require a constitutional amendment? I don't today? know. My instinct is it's probably a constitutional amendment. I'm sure someone who's got the, the expertise will call in shortly and, and give the answer, but uh, it's probably a constitutional. If not, uh, uh, however, it needs to be done. Period. Okay. All right. This is Chuck. Chuck, yeah, you were going to uh, ask a question. I apologize for yeah. getting off. Oh, that's fine, Governor, because what you said was important. What I'm worried about is Obama's cutting our defense badly. I'm a disabled veteran. What are you going to do about defense of our country, our military? That's what I'm concerned yeah, about. Yeah, well, the right. question doesn't need to be, and I think this uh, his complete lack of leadership dealing with this committee that's been uh, – uh, the president should have stood up and said, here's how we're going to get this country's uh, budget back. Uh, and, and you do it by pulling back all these regulations that are costing money, and you have to have the courage to stand up and say, listen, we're going to quit spending money we don't have on programs we don't want. We have the, less the, than a minute, this, sir. This president's never going to do that, but the point is we're going to have to change presidents, and using the military as a trading chit is bad public policy, period. The question always should be not how much does it cost us to, to run our military? The question should always be how much are we do we need to spend to keep this country secure well, and to second, take care of the veterans who have given yeah. so much to this country. In the seconds remaining, what do you want us to know more than anything else? Well, this country is worth, uh, uh, as Chuck has said here, you know, it's worth fighting and dying for. And that's really what we have at hand here. Let's take this country back. Let's get a president who understands that you got to get Americans working. If you don't get the economy right, nothing else really matters. Governor Rick Perry, thank you for joining us. Good to be with you, Jan. Thank I, you, sir. I never think about messing with Texas. Never, ever. <laughs>